Hello and welcome to part two of the Jewish Rehabilitation Hospital's video presentation on stroke. This part covers topics on how to prevent a stroke or another stroke. We will discuss in detail the risk factors for stroke and what you can do to modify them. The risk factors for stroke fall into two categories, those that you can change, but there are some factors that you can't change, and those are your age. Two-thirds of stroke happen over the age of 65 years old. So the older you are, that increases your risk for stroke. Males are more at risk than females because females have a hormone that provides them uh, some sort of protection against stroke. African, South Asian, or Aboriginal people are more at risk for strokes than the other races due to their cultural dietary habits. If you have a family history of stroke, if your parent, grandparent, brother or sister had a stroke, this puts you more at risk, especially if the stroke happened before the age of 65 years old. If you've already had a stroke, this increases your chance of another stroke within the next five years by 33%. Do you know what are the risk factors you can work on and change to help decrease the risk of having another stroke? Here are the risk factors you can do something about and change depending on which ones pertain to you high blood pressure, excess weight, diabetes, smoking, heart disease, sleep apnea, high cholesterol, lack of exercise, drinking too much alcohol, and stress. All these factors increase your risk of stroke. High blood pressure is one of the most important risk factors for stroke because it is responsible for 65% of all strokes. You need to know and control your blood pressure by making lifestyle changes and making sure you take your blood pressure medication as prescribed. When talking about blood pressure, you must be aware and know the three important numbers representing blood pressure. The top number is what we call the systolic blood pressure. The bottom number is what we call the diastolic blood pressure. And the third number represents your pulse, the number of heartbeats per minute. When your heart beats, it squeezes and pushes blood through your arteries so it can supply the rest of your body. This force creates pressure on those vessels and that's what your systolic blood pressure is. The diastolic, the bottom number, is the pressure in the arteries when the heart is at rest between the heartbeats. This is the time when the heart fills with blood and gets oxygen. A normal blood pressure for an adult less than 80 years old is a systolic blood pressure of less than 140 and a diastolic blood pressure of less than 90. For an adult who is over 80 years old, a systolic blood pressure of less than 150 is acceptable. But if you have diabetes, no matter what your age is, you should maintain a blood pressure of less than 130 over 80. This slide gives you examples of different blood pressures and which are within the normal ranges and which are too high. When taking your blood pressure, it is important to do so the right way. Don't talk while your blood pressure is being taken. The cuff should be at heart level and it should be the right size. Keep your back supported, be seated at a 90 degree angle, relaxed, calm, 
keep legs uncrossed and ensure that your arm is well supported. If you have exercised, don't take your blood pressure. Wait 30 minutes. Don't smoke or drink coffee one hour before taking your blood pressure. Make sure your bladder is empty and validate that your machine is working properly. If you have doubts about the validity of your machine, visit www.hypertension.ca and they will give you suggestions on how to test your machine or you can visit your local pharmacist. Here are some examples of how not to take your blood pressure. In the first picture to the left, you'll see that the blood pressure is being taken but the arm is unsupported. The man on the chair, he has his legs crossed. The woman in the doctor's office, that blood pressure is being taken while the nurse or doctor is holding the arm and it's not well supported. In the picture on the far right bottom, this is the right way. Next, we'll be looking at how to manage blood pressure through food. Most of us know that we need to limit the amount of salt intake and foods that are high in sodium. But what is also important to do is increase the intake of high potassium foods. Let's look at foods high in sodium. The following list of foods should be avoided or at least limited. For example, canned products. Some examples of canned products include canned vegetables, canned legumes, canned soups. Another food high in sodium are cold cuts, as well as cheese. Many people enjoy eating cheese. However, if you are one to eat cheese every day, it is important to cut back by half, therefore no more than three times a week. Likewise, if you eat cheese four times a week, cut back always by half the amount, therefore no more than twice a week. A fourth group of food that needs to be limited or avoided are processed foods. For example, Boxed pizza is a type of processed food. Processed food are foods that are ready to eat, ready to serve, placed in the microwave or in the oven, and it's ready in several minutes. Another example are boxed chicken tenders or fish filet. I'd like to discuss food items which are very good for hypertension. Those are foods that are high in potassium, such as fresh fruits and vegetables. I also encourage all of you to drink milk, eat some yogurt, legumes such as kidney beans, lentils, black beans are rich in potassium as well. Salmon is another example of a high potassium food as well as pork. Another way to lower salt intake is to reduce the amount of added salt in your cooking by half. If your recipe calls for one teaspoon of salt, I encourage you to use only half a teaspoon of salt. Also, it is important to avoid the salt shaker at the table. One teaspoon of salt is equal to 2,300 milligrams of sodium. The maximum amount of sodium that we should be consuming is no more than 2,000 milligrams per day. Instead of using salt, try using other type of herbs and spices. Pepper, paprika, cayenne, basil, thyme, marjoram are some examples to name a few. Mrs. Dash is a salt substitute and equally good to use during the cooking or at the table. 
Another way to reduce the amount of sodium in your diet is when you're doing groceries, be very careful at reading the nutrition label and paying attention to the ingredient list. When you look at your food item, the ingredient list is always listed. If you notice words such as sodium, soda, and salt in the first three ingredients of your ingredient list, well, that product may be very concentrated in sodium. Looking at the nutrition facts table is another way to decide if the product is a good product or not. So how to read a nutrition facts table? Here we have an example whereby half a cup of our product, if we scroll down and look for the word sodium, has 250 milligrams of sodium. On the left hand side, you'll notice that less than 200 milligrams of sodium is considered a good product. If the product has two to 400 milligrams of sodium for the quantity indicated, you can choose that product, but not very often. The moment that a food item has more than 400 milligrams of sodium for the quantity specified, it's best not to purchase that item because it's very high in sodium. If retaining these numbers is too difficult, a simpler way is looking at the percent daily value. If you observe the nutrition facts table, you will notice there's a percentage on the far right side. Therefore, you want to aim for no more than 10% of the daily value. So keep in mind, less than 200 milligrams of sodium or no more than 10% are the numbers to keep in mind when doing groceries. Another way to reduce the amount of sodium in your diet is by being weary of nutrition claims. On food packages, you'll notice in bold, nutrition claims written. This is to attract the buyer to purchase the item. It'll be written in bold, low in sodium, 25% less sodium, unsalted, no added salt. What does it really mean? Well, here is an example of a product that has 25% less sodium. If we look at the nutrition facts table, we observe that for half a cup of this product, there is 660 milligrams of sodium, or 28% of the daily value. From the previous slide, we know that our target is 200 milligrams, or 10%. Therefore, although this label is indicating 25% less sodium, it is 25% less than the original package. Therefore, try to have a habit of always reading the nutrition facts to really decipher if a product is good or not. Here's a small quiz. Which would you choose? You're in the grocery store and you have these three products before you. Kraft Singles, where one slice of 19 grams is 300 milligrams of sodium. Cracker Barrel, one slice of 20 grams is equivalent to 140 milligrams of sodium. And Black Diamond Slices, whereby one slice of 19 grams is 260 milligrams. If you choose B, you're right. Another way to decrease cardiovascular risk is to manage your weight. How do you know if you are at a healthy weight? Well, measure your waist circumference. Separate your feet shoulder width apart. Take a measuring tape and measure around your waist at the level of your belly button. You want to target no more than 32 inches for women and no more than 38 win inches for men. Another way to reduce your cardiovascular risk is to manage your diabetes. Take medication as prescribed by your doctor or pharmacist. Certain medications must be taken 30 minutes before a meal, such as diabetic. 
Glucophage, on the other hand, should be taken at mealtime, and insulin may be prescribed several times a day. Follow your diet as recommended by your dietitian. Maintain a normal blood sugar level between 4 and 7. A hemoglobin A1C test may also be recommended by your doctor, and the target level for that is less than 7%. This test looks at your blood sugar level over the last three months. Measure your s blood sugars as su suggested. At times, could be once a day and up to four times a day. Next, let's look at how to plan for eating healthy according to Candace Food Guide. If you notice the diagram in front of you, there is a plate. It's divided into three sections. Ideally, half of your plate should consist of vegetables and fruit, more vegetables than fruit. Another quarter of your plate should be protein foods, such as legumes, lean red meat, poultry, tofu, fish, yogurt, or eggs. And the last quarter of your dish should be whole grain foods, such as whole grain bread, brown rice, whole grain pasta. This is what a healthy plate should look like. Next, let's look at some very simple recommendations to help you control your weight and blood sugar levels. It is important to eat three meals a day at regular hours. The space in between the meals should not exceed six hours. Therefore, if breakfast is at 7.30, your next meal should be no later than 1.30. Include healthy snacks at regular time as well. What is a healthy snack? It is a combination of high fiber foods and protein rich foods. Eating an apple is very healthy, especially if you keep the skin, you have high fiber choice. But there isn't a protein choice if the apple is your only snack. Eating yogurt is also very healthy and a good choice because it is rich in protein. But a healthy snack is a combination of both nutrients, fiber and protein. So best to take half an apple sliced, keep the skin to get the fiber, and a small container of yogurt to obtain the protein. That is more of a complete snack. Another example of a complete snack could be a slice of whole grain bread to obtain fiber with a thin spread of almond butter or peanut butter to obtain protein. Again, combination of protein and fiber render the snack complete and a healthy snack. Another way to control your weight and blood sugar is to decrease the intake of sweet and fatty foods. If you're thirsty, drink water. It is the number one beverage of choice. And stay active. Smoking is another risk factor for stroke and it triples your risk. What happens when you smoke a cigarette? The nicotine in the cigarette decreases the size of your arteries, which in turn increases your blood pressure for a good 20 minutes after you have smoked that one cigarette. Smoking also increases your chances of atherosclerosis, which is a disease where there is plaque buildup inside your arteries. Smoking also decreases your good cholesterol. Being smoke free and not exposing yourself to secondhand smoke will help you in decreasing your risk. Once you have stopped smoking for five years, your risk for a stroke are the same as that of a non-smoker. If you are interested to quit smoking, there are many resources out there that are available to you. Speak to your nurse or doctor to see which ones are right for you. 
It's worth mentioning that in Laval, there is a free smoking cessation program available to the public through a program called Cible Santé. Speak to your nurse. She has the details. Another risk factor for stroke is heart disease. Heart disease is any condition that affects the structure or function of the heart. Most people think of heart disease as one condition, but in fact heart disease is a group of conditions with many different root causes. There are many different types of heart disease. Here are some examples. Coronary artery disease or vascular disease causes the hardening of the arteries. Another name for this is atherosclerosis. Heart rhythm disorders like arrhythmia or atrial fibrillation cause the heart to beat too fast or too slow or in an irregular fashion. Millions of Canadians experience heart rhythm disorders which disrupt blood flow and some have no symptoms or warning signs. Structural heart disease refers to abnormalities of the heart structure like the valves, the walls, the muscles, or blood vessels near the heart. And it can be present at birth or after birth due to infection, wear and tear, or other factors. Heart failure is another condition that is quite serious and develops after the heart becomes damaged or weakened. The two most common causes of heart failure are heart attack and high blood pressure. There is no cure but early diagnosis, life changes, and medication can help people lead an active life, stay out of hospital, and live longer. Heart disease is preventable. To diagnose heart disease, your doctor may run a flu of tests. Or after you've had a stroke, the doctors will run tests to investigate if there is any heart disease condition present that may have caused your stroke. Some of those are, for example, electrocardiogram. An electrocardiogram checks how your heart is functioning by measuring the electrical activity of the heart. Holter monitoring is usually used to diagnose heart rhythm disturbances and the monitor is usually worn for 24 hours or longer. A Doppler ultrasound shows blood flow through the arteries. A cardiac ultrasound called either a transthoracic echocardiogram or a transesophageal echocardiogram is a special type of echocardiogram often used to see if your heart could be producing blood clots. There are two types of medications used and prescribed after an ischemic stroke. They are anticoagulants and or antiplatelet. An anticoagulant are blood thinners that prevent new blood clots from forming and keep existing blood clots from getting larger. They work by interfering with certain parts of the blood needed to form clots. They are usually prescribed for people with uh, an irregular heartbeat or arrhythmia, which can cause blood clots to travel from the heart to the brain. They are commonly used and prescribed for those who have had a stroke to prevent the stroke from reoccurring. Examples of an anticoagulant are Coumadin, Xarelto, Eliquis, or Heparin, Fragmin, Lovenox, which are given uh, as an injection. When your skin is cut, platelets bind together to form a blood clot, which stops the bleeding. In the same way, when your blood vessel in your brain is injured, Platelets will gather there to try to repair the blood vessel and then cause a blood clot. However, as we know, blood clots 
can cause stroke. So antiplatelet drugs will help prevent platelets from sticking together and prevent this blood clot from forming in that vessel. After a stroke, the most commonly used antiplatelet drug is aspirin. After a second stroke, Plavix will be added. There's also a medication called Agrinox that is available, but we see this less and less prescribed because it is, it is uh, known to cause migraines. Good sleep is necessary for good health. Experts say we need 7 to 9 hours of good quality sleep each night to stay in good health. Not getting enough sleep can stress the body in many different ways. Over time, it can increase your risk of high blood pressure, diabetes, and coronary artery disease. It can increase your risk of heart attack and stroke. It changes the hormones that control your eating habits, causing you to gain weight. Lack of sleep increases tiredness and fatigue. This makes you too tired to make healthy lifestyle changes and causes unhealthy lifestyle choices. It makes you less able to cope well with the normal changes of life. It can increase your stress, anxiety, and cause depression. Many people go undiagnosed with sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a condition which causes abnormal breathing during sleep. People with sleep apnea have multiple extended pauses in their breathing when they sleep. And these temporary breathing pauses cause lower quality sleep and affect the body's blood supply of oxygen to the brain, increasing the risk of stroke. Some of the signs of sleep apnea is um, snoring, including snoring that is especially loud and it involves gasping, choking, or snorting that may cause a person to briefly wake up during the night, waking up in a panic or with anxiety, non-restorative sleep, which leads to daytime sleepiness, fatigue, no energy, waking up with a headache, or waking up during the night in a sweat. You are uncharacteristically irritable, moody, or depressed. Another sign is having a wide neck. Diagnosis and treatment of sleep apnea are done in a sleep clinic. High blood cholesterol is one of the major controllable risk factors for stroke. If we look at the picture on the right, the first is a picture of a healthy, normal artery with normal blood flow. The second artery shows the start of yellow plaque formation, and the plaque is made up of fat, cholesterol, calcium, and other substances found in the blood. Over time, the plaque hardens, gets bigger, and narrows your arteries, and this limits the flow of oxygen-rich blood to your organs and other parts of your body. Some people who have atherosclerosis have no signs or symptoms. It can only be diagnosed after a heart attack or stroke. Making some lifestyle changes is a positive way to control your blood cholesterol level. What you eat has a huge impact on your health. Highly processed foods are a major source of saturated fat and cholesterol and are usually high in calories, salt, and sugar. Saturated fat increases your bad cholesterol levels in your blood. Your doctor will prescribe medications to lower your cholesterol. And these medications do not cure high blood cholesterol or replace a healthy lifestyle. And when taking high cholesterol medication, it is important to avoid grapefruit or grapefruit juice as it can it interfere with the efficacy of the medication. When looking at cholesterol values, what must be considered is the complete lipid profile. This is what a lipid profile looks like. The total cholesterol should be less than 5.2 for normal value. A normal HDL value is more than 1 millimole per liter. 
but if your postmenopausal woman want to aim for more than 1.3 millimole per liter. The HDL is also known as the good cholesterol. It stands for high density lipoprotein. The LDL cholesterol should be less than 3.4. However, if you are diabetic or suffered an ischemic stroke, you want to target an LDL value less than 2 millimole per liter. LDL cholesterol is the bad cholesterol. It stands for low density lipoprotein. And triglycerides. Want to target your triglyceride level less than 1.7 millimole per liter. Triglyceride, like cholesterol, is simply another type of fat. How to increase the HDL level or good cholesterol? Include olive oil in your diet. However, don't fry using olive oil because it has a low smoke point and this unsaturated fat at a high heat will become saturated. So use olive oil raw over a salad or cooked vegetable. Include fatty fish in your diet such as rainbow trout, salmon, red tuna, sardines, to name a few. Lose weight to help increase your HDL level. Exercise regularly. Quit smoking if you are a smoker. And drink in moderate amounts. Later on I will discuss what is moderate drinking. As I mentioned earlier, the LDL cholesterol is the bad cholesterol. So here are a list of foods that will increase your LDL. Red meat. It is encouraged to eat no more than six ounces of lean red meat per week. Cake, pastries, rich desserts also increase the bad cholesterol. Fried foods contain saturated fats, trans fats, which increase the bad cholesterol. Processed foods, including cold cuts, as well as the skin of your poultry. It's okay to eat chicken, just make sure that you remove the skin. And salty snacks, such as chips and buttered popcorn, to name some. On the other hand, here are a list of foods that I do encourage you to eat because they help reduce the LDL, such as fresh fruits and vegetables, Mono and polyunsaturated fats are considered good fats. Find in your olive oil, safflower sunflower oil, canola oil, in your avocado. Legumes are excellent for your health, which also help reduce the LDL cholesterol. Fatty fish, whole grain foods, unsalted nuts and seeds are an excellent snack and soy protein, such as tofu or soy milk. Here's another quiz. Which of these following foods do you think will lower your LDL cholesterol? If you guess salmon and olive oil, you're right. If your LDL cholesterol is elevated, it is important to include plant sterols in your diet. What are plant sterols and how do they work? Well, if you look at the image on the left, this is what happens if you don't have plant sterols in your diet. When we eat foods that have fat, particularly saturated trans fats, like chicken wings or saturated fat in our cheese, a large part of the fat will enter into the digestive system and then get absorbed into the bloodstream therefore increasing the LDL levels. However, when plant sterols are included in your diet, they will bind to the fat or cholesterol and therefore a larger amount will be eliminated in the digestive tract and less will be absorbed into the bloodstream. We find plant sterols naturally in fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, legumes and vegetable oils. 
Studies have shown you must consume more than two grams of plant cereals a day to decrease your bad cholesterol by 10% in just two to three weeks. Quite efficient. And it can potentially reduce the risk of coronary heart disease by 20% over a lifetime. Unfortunately, to obtain the two grams from our diet, we must consume up to 105 bananas a day, 154 tomatoes, or 50 oranges to get the two grams of plant sterols recommended. Food companies have come to our rescue. There are some products out there that do contain concentrated amounts in plant sterols. For example, the Oasis Health Break Coles Prevent Juice and Minute Maid HeartWise Juice contain plant sterols. One cup provides one gram of plant sterols. The Centrum Cardial Multivitamin also contains plant sterols. Two tablets a day provides one gram of plant sterols. Miracle Reds is a supplement often found on the Costco website. And one and a half tablespoon of this powder mixed with water will provide the one gram of plant sterol your body needs. Bestel Proactive is another type of food item that provides plant sterols. Five teaspoons a day provides the two grams your body needs. If you are a diabetic, please be careful with regards to the Centrum Cardio as well as the juice. If your blood sugars are not very well controlled, focus on obtaining plant sterols from the Miracle Reds or from the Bacel Proactive. If your sugars are poorly controlled, the juice may spike it up a little more. And if you have kidney problems or insufficiency, the Centrum Cardio may not be a supplement for you. Consult your doctor to see if it is something that he would recommend. Next, let's look at how to decrease the triglyceride levels. Focus on reducing white flour-based carbohydrate and sugar. White bread, white pasta, concentrated sugars from honey and molasses, white and brown sugar. These are food items that will spike up your triglyceride levels if eaten in considerable amounts. Alcohol as well can increase the triglyceride levels, therefore reduce the alcohol intake. On the other hand, I encourage you to eat omega-rich foods and exercise regularly to help lower your triglyceride levels. Next, let's look at the three classes of omega-3, DHA and EPA, as well as ALA. The DHA and EPA have a direct link with reducing triglyceride levels. Two to four grams per day can reduce your blood triglyceride level by 25 to 45%. Where is it that you can obtain these type of omega-3s is by eating fatty fish such as mackerel, sardines, rainbow trout, red tuna, herring, cod. How about if you're not a fish lover and you don't like eating fish? Well, Nutri-C Omega-3 supplementation may be an option for you. This type of supplement doesn't have a fishy odor nor a fishy taste. However, refer to your doctor if Omega-3 supplementation is for you. For those who've had a hemorrhagic stroke, it may not be a good supplement to take. Omega-3 ALA is an essential fat for the body. It is a great nutrient because it's not synthesized by the body. However, eating foods that have ALA omega-3 is not directly linked with improved triglyceride levels. It needs to be converted to DHA EPA before there's an effect on your blood triglyceride level. O canola oil, walnuts, omega-3 egg, omega-3 orange juice, ground flax seeds are some examples of ALA omega-3. 
if your triglyceride levels are elevated, focus on fish first. Next, I'd like to look at three different types of beverages and its effect on cardiovascular disease. The first, alcohol. The greater the consumption of alcohol, the greater the risk of cardiovascular disease. Men should drink no more than two drinks a day. Women, one drink a day. What is one drink equivalent to? A bottle of beer of 12 ounces, a glass of wine of 5 ounces, and no more than one and a half ounces of liquor constitutes one portion or one drink. The second beverage I'd like to look at is the consumption of regular soda versus diet soda on cardiovascular risk. A huge meta-analysis was conducted. It's a huge study that included more than 300,000 participants. And what they found was that there was a 13% greater risk of stroke and 22% greater risk of myocardial infarct when more than one can of regular soda was consumed. The study went on to see the risk when diet soda was consumed. And there was still an 8% greater risk of stroke and 5% greater risk for myocardial infarct with increased amounts of diet soda. There wasn't an amount specified. They just noted that the greater the amount of diet soda someone consumed, the greater the risk of stroke and heart disease. Therefore, the recommendation is to drink the least amount possible. The third beverage I'd like to discuss is the consumption of tea and cardiovascular health. The study showed that with increased green tea consumption, it was associated with a decreased risk of cardiovascular disease. In fact, up to three cups of green tea a day can reduce the risk of myocardial infarct by 19% and decrease the risk of stroke by 36%. Green tea is an unfermented tea and therefore has greater amount of catechines, making it a healthy beverage. Another risk factor for cardiovascular disease is lack of exercise. Individuals who are inactive are twice at risk for heart disease and stroke. Therefore, the recommendation is to move every day, about 30 minutes a day, or at least 150 minutes per week. For those of you who are confined to a wheelchair, try to propel your wheelchair as much as possible. And even if that is difficult, then move your arm. Mobility is very important and must be practiced every day. Stress can contribute to the development of heart disease and stroke. If you have high stress levels or have been stressed for a long period of time, this has been shown to increase blood cholesterol levels and increase blood pressure, having blood platelets that are more likely to clot. So effectively dealing with your stressors will enable you to get on the right track for a healthier lifestyle. Other recommendations are to see your family doctor regularly. If you do not have a family doctor and are looking for one, consider signing up online for a family doctor and this will put you on a waiting list for the next available family doctor. It is called Guichet d'accès aux médecins de famille. You can also register to the Quebec Health Booklet that is available online and this tool will allow you to access your health in some of your health information. Please take your medications as prescribed. Studies show that 12% of people stop their medications after one month and 40% after a year. Before stopping or making any changes to your medications, please consult your doctor. Follow your diet as suggested by your doctor and dietitian. Remember, gradual changes and exercise daily. The Heart and Stroke Foundation of Quebec is one of the best resources in terms of information regarding stroke.
another resource is the Stroke Aphasic Association of Laval. This is an association that provides a slew of activities for patients and their families who have suffered a stroke or are aphasic. And these are some of the activities they offer. Through Cible Santé here in Laval, they offer a workshop called Prevention, which covers the basic general knowledge about a healthy lifestyle. They will help you identify risk factors for chronic disease and receive coaching to change some of those habits. It's an eight month long program offered in the day or the evening. The first three sessions are group sessions and they cover topics on nutrition, stress, self-management, smoking, and physical activity. You will then set a goal, one goal for yourself. And the following five sessions will be a one-on-one -on -one follow up with either a dietitian, a kinesiologist, a social worker, or a nurse, depending on the goal that you set for yourself. This workshop is offered in French only, but individual sessions are available in English. I hope this presentation has helped you in your understanding of stroke and helped motivate you to make lifestyle changes. If you are in need of any written information or pamphlets from the Heart and Stroke Foundation, refer to your nurse as there are many resources on the unit available for you.